Hey, you just turned into First Issue Club Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have a mirror, go ahead and look at it. If you're seeing yourself as a person that every week buys First Issues and wants to read them with a reading club, you join the exact right podcast. If you're like, nah, I'm not that gal. And maybe you're just seeing a person that's moderately interested in comics and really wants to get into them. This podcast is also for you. So thanks for joining the club. This week, we're covering comics out of January 17th. We've got Damage from DC, Days of Hate from Image, Ice Cream Man from Image, and we threw in a fourth book because we did a Twitter poll. So hit us up, always look for what we're doing at First Issue Club, F-I-R-S-T, and resounding, like I'm talking 100 votes for this Alterna book called Go West. So we were like, hell yeah, we're going to throw in a fourth book. If you don't know about Alterna Comics, we're going to cover that, tell you all about that goodness that is that publisher later in this podcast. So stay tuned. Who do we got in the club today? And if you could be trapped in any, any horror movie and you were the villain, what would that scenario be? My name is Greg Lichtai, and if, if I could be in any horror movie trapped there and I was the villain, it would be Tremors. And if you're not familiar with Tremors, there are these little monsters that live underground. They just come up out of the ground, and then they just gobble you right up and then suck right back down on the ground. Because there's no cooler villain than a villain you cannot reason with. Hell yeah. All right, all right. This is a little off. I bet Tremors give good fellatio. <laughs> I, I bet they don't because they're all teeth. Oh, they are? Oh, oh. <laughs> They got no tongue? Yeah. Okay. I think they have one, but they're mostly teeth. <laughs> okay, perfect. So if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> All right. uh, That's mine. Uh, my name is Caitlin Morosik. I don't really enjoy scary movies. Well, so I do, but it's problematic because I have an automatic physical reaction where I start to cry. But I think that um, one movie that I really did like that I could be the villain for would be Cabin in the Woods. Well, I don't want to ruin it if anybody hasn't seen it because that is one you could spoilers. easily ruin. Spoilers ahead. Yeah. Skip ahead two I minutes. I literally, I saw that book on my shelf today, or sorry, that DVD on my shelf, and I just like popped it in because I was like, yes. oh, this movie's so fucking good. It's I, so good. I'm just going to watch it today. Yeah. And I can, that's the kind of horror I can handle. Yeah. Yeah. I think don't ruin that, I guess, because yeah. it's like two movies in one. But if you haven't seen that yet, get your, your get on it. Yeah. I would be the villain that you, that I would have to ruin to tell people about. <laughs> that is just such for a the good people pick. people yeah. that have seen it. Yeah. Um, this is Budget King, and I would choose Aliens, uh, probably my favorite horror franchise, and I would be in Aliens 2, the queen, which I think is a dragon morph, because she's just so badass, but as a child, I actually had this thing. I was really into villains, like, I would, I, so I cried when the queen got, gets pushed out into outer space oh, no. um, as a child. Why my mom is letting me watch <laughs> that movie at that age is, uh, is because she's an awesome mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but I also thought of myself as like a bad kid. Like I was bad kid. Y- yeah. Or Were I'm you the one. sitting like ants on fire with like a magnifying <laughs> glass or just like... I was the one that was going to get in trouble. So I really, the plight of the aliens who are just hungry, get off my fucking planet, like is something I really sympathize with. <laughs> and they aren't going to follow humans' rules. And that was the same child I was. I'm not going to follow <laughs> your human <laughs> rules, mom. <laughs> exactly. All right, let's get this podcast started. <laughs> My name is Greg Lichtai, and I'm covering DC's Damage. Words by Daniel and Venditti, art by Mickey. Damage is a character ripped straight out of the pages of DC's metal. We open with a man named Ethan, chained to a table in a plane and not being pleased one bit about it. We watch as Ethan transforms before our eyes into a hulking beast, known to us as Damage. If you didn't catch that, not to worry. The word Damage is used no less than 15 times in this book. Ethan, a.k.a. Damage, rampages through a city that we later learn is Atlanta, and he is confronted by a soldier in special made armor that gives him the ability to take on Damage. Damage and the soldier, Major Liggett, exchange verbal barbs along with their physical interactions, and we find out that Major Liggett has a personal vendetta for attacking Damage. He wants to be Damage. Eventually, 
damage overpowers the major and escapes and is soothed and reasoned with by some internal voice that we assume is Ethan trying to regain control over his body. The voice reminds him that the innocent people around him don't deserve the pain and violence that he wants to invoke upon them, but the woman who created him does. We are then introduced to that woman, Colonel Maria Jonas, as she, as she surveying the damage that damage caused. While she's looking over the area, instructing soldiers on how to find damage, she is confronted by Amanda Waller and the Suicide Squad, and no one looks happy to see each other. Okay, so there's a lot in this book and a lot of things I could say about this book. Uh, we're going to get into that, but I have a question to give to the club. So we learned that damage, his power is, if you need a little visual, essentially the Hulk. But it's a little different than the Hulk because damage's powers work that in a 24-hour span, he can only Ethan can only be damaged for one hour. Now, my question to the club is, is that logical? <laughs> of course. <laughs> that seems like, did they do that so they could control him? Yeah, because he's like a weapon. Yeah, I get like okay, yeah, he's like Weapon H. <clears throat> here's, right. Here's my question though. It sounded like he initially agreed to be damaged. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So and even being damaged might be a coveted thing, as we did, see. Yeah. From and by the way, I want to point this out. I'm so glad it's Leggett and not Captain Legit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Major Leggett sounds like something that you would call someone to insult them. Yeah. <laughs> Where to go, Major Leggett? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was rude. <laughs> I'll answer your question by saying if there's an interview that exists out there that says D- DC was just like, this is us sh- showing you we could do the Hulk better. If they own that, then I love this book. Right. Because that's essentially what it is. This yeah. is the Hulk. Yeah. Or more sp- specifically, it's Weapon H. Who it's the it's the newer version the of Hulk. The new version of Hulk. Uh, yeah. It, if that is the case, then I'm kind of like, yeah, I, I wonder if they could do it better. If that's not the case, then I I don't I can't even begin to answer if one hour within twenty four hours makes sense. <laughs> I was kind of excited that there's a new DC, just like hero, I guess, or maybe villain. I don't really know. Just that is this is completely new, right? Yeah, it's part of this thing called the new age of DC heroes, and okay. they actually have a, a whole line of new superheroes they're going to introduce uh, in the coming months. Some I, are probably going to work, and some are really not going to work. Right. I had notes on here that said those traps. And I kept on being like, what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> uh, his, like, traps, the muscles, the way they draw oh. his muscles on here, he looks like Goldberg. <laughs> and He's I, huge. I, if I, as, I, as a kid, if I picked this up, I'd be like, fuck yeah, favorite superhero. Uh-huh. Like, More muscles, the better. Yeah. <laughs> the muscles on this guy is so badass. I don't hate this, I have to say. <laughs> I, I don't hate it because I think they're going to, I hope they go super campy with it. Like, you know how some B, B movies are so bad yeah. they're good? I'm kind of hoping this is what damage is. I'll tell you right now. They're not going campy with this. Uh, <laughs> right? I mean, you can tell from this. They, this is very serious to them, which is why my crux of my argument is that if, this, if they would own it and just be like, we just wanted to do Hulk better. Like, there's a lot of that in Marvel. I, I can't name them right now, but, like, there's a lot of shared, like, um, people, like, I don't know. We talked about Deadpool and Harley Quinn. But like how there's like both stuff, and they're kind of like, eh, wasn't Doomsday their Hulk? No, Doomsday's just always Doomsday. Sorry. Yes, Doomsday. Yes, yeah, Doomsday. They didn't have a Hulk. They didn't have somebody that just had raging powers they couldn't explain or they couldn't control. Yeah, you're right. They have like big characters, but nothing like Bruce yeah. Banner and the, the key. Hulk. The key to doing Hulk well, and you got tell me if this is, if you agree with this, is making him interesting while he's Hulked out, giving him like powers and destination and things like that. Yeah. Because Hulk almost has, like, a childlike innocence when he is Hulk. Yeah. He's like he's like Frankenstein's monster. Right. Yeah. Frankenstein's a really good comparison to Hulk. I don't really care about Bruce Banner and his struggles and his, like, just being so fucking emo and stuff like that, right? But I do care. I'm, I'm interested when Hulk is Hulk. Yeah. Well, because... This is gonna we're gonna end up talking about the Hulk when we're doing a DC book. <laughs> You're right. But when the Hulk first came out, he was actually a lot more intelligent. Oh, when, he, he, when he was. He, when he transformed transformed into Hulk, he could form more form more sentences, and he was actually gray. Like the, the, the yeah. tone of his skin was gray. Hmm. So it's kind of a weird thing how that character transformed. Well, I don't know. Go for it, DC. Don't worry about it. DC's <laughs> the guy that's like 
He, I own I own a Burger King franchise, and there's a Chick Fil A and a KFC right by me. <laughs> and fuck it, if I'm not gonna put my Burger King right in between there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's that character on The Simpsons? Gil something like he's always down on his luck and trying to like the next big thing. Like, come on, you gotta work for Gil. <laughs> I feel like these uh, superheroes is Gil pitching this to DC. Like, yeah, uh, DC Hulk. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Sony Tesla. <laughs> 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 uh, I had to say something real quick about uh, Maria Jonas. Yeah. Uh, th- that is uh, Nick Fury. Yeah. Yep, yeah. you are so right. I, I, right when, <laughs> and she has eye patch at all. A fucking eye patch. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. I'm Caitlin Morosik, and I will be covering images. Ice Cream Man, words and art by Prince and Morazzo. So to start the cover of, so the, there were a couple of covers, but the one I had was a bunch of children's faces with the titular character, the ice cream man right in the center, holding up a cone for, for you to see. And it was like, it manages to be light and fluffy and foreboding. And just, there's something about ice cream men that seem creepy anyway. I don't know if it's like just an excess of pure joy or Loving other people's children enough to drive them around and give them treats. I don't really know. Or that they're dealing drugs in your neighborhood. Yeah, also that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's um, it's creepy anyway, but it promises to be sort of a creepy, juxtaposed, Twilight Zone, Goosebumps type of zany adventure. Um, these are all going to be, it's a series that's going to be self-contained one-shots. So that's kind of the feel you're getting here. One of our main characters, aside from the ice cream man in this first issue, is Byron McAllister, a big and tall boy (laughs) whose pet spider has recently killed his parents, leaving Byron in denial about um, the death of his parents and their bodies at the kitchen table. Knowing that it's going to be kind of these self-contained, wacky adventures with this ice cream man in the center makes this a little bit more cohesive for me and a lot more fun to have read. What do you guys think? I loved this book. Yeah, I thought it was awesome. Reading the, like, little primer, primer, of this, it it said like something to the effect of like Ice Cream Man is your Tales from the Crypt uh, guy, and he's gonna give you these like little mini horror sh- things. And I was like, I don't need that. Like, I, I don't really just want a horror book for the sake of being a horror book. That's not what this is. I think they're gonna connect in some like interesting way. And the stories that you're able to tell by giving the limitation, I think, is evident in how good this first issue was, and like scary and, and riveting. Mm-hmm. By by giving the limitation that it has to be somehow tied into him, the ice cream man. Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe have approached some type of resolution within the comic. Like, yeah. I, I think you said they're one shots. Yep. In some ways, yeah. Well, and, that's what I read. Okay, yeah. So I didn't I didn't know that. Um, and so yeah, that I think that's really cool. That like each book is like it's like the hyper excitement of going monthly and grabbing this is like you're gonna get this cool contained story. And by the way, this story is like a great horror story. The stakes are high. They pull some crazy like like turns and stuff. This is seriously is like just a way creepier um, Twilight Zone for yeah. me when I read it. Because even when I was reading like the little blurbs when he's talking. That it was a guy's voice in my head from the Twilight Zone who was <laughs> reading it to me, <laughs> and I seriously thought this book really nailed it out of the park with all of it, art, storytelling, pacing. I thought it was incredible. Um, okay, so I, w- I wanted to say, um, so the guy at the comic book shop told me that these are each independent stories, but they're still like intertwined some way. So like one character who's in one issue, like the next character character will be like. The boyfriend to that character or whatever. Oh. So it's kind of like this weird intertwining of this town's basically misery because of this ice cream man. If he just goes to s- suburban areas like subdivisions and just wreaks havoc, uh, I think that's a great premise. Mm-hmm. Like, I hope he just keeps on being in suburban landscapes. Yeah. And just, like, fucking with, like, <laughs> white picket fences. Yeah. Yeah. The Middle one, America. The one... So I read... I read up a little bit on this and the one quote that I thought that was interesting that was that they're trying to what I don't know how they phrase the context of this but it was exploring the darkness inside the human spirit as well as the light that brings redemption 
And so the redemption part was the part that threw me. Like, I'm not sure that does maybe get into little a little more of what the Twilight Zone did, where it's like, or what Black Mirror does. It's making you think to provoke, like, maybe how you could change certain things. But I don't know how that fits into this, like, zany, horror, hmm. suburban. No. I don't know. This is like a succubus, incubus. This is like one of those demons. You know those demons? It doesn't want like succubus. Yeah, fuck you as like a baby or something like that. Whoa. What? <laughs> is uh, that no, <laughs> no? A succubus is like um, they. There's no baby sex. <laughs> no, like they change form to like convince you to do something, and then like once you agree to like do what? something, you become their slave. Like, okay. You're, like, uh, uh, like they leech off of you. Anyway, this is a demon just having fun. <laughs> yeah. I, did, I did not get any moral I don't redemption. Need, but if, if there's going to be a couple of recurring people, maybe they're going to be who we see that from. Okay. Just it, an additional thought. They do comment how crazy this particular town is. So I was a little bit surprised that all the things weren't going to take place in this town. We, uh, in the last panel, we see him driving right. off. Maybe he, that's just the end of the day. Maybe just closing up shop. Yeah. I think I think he's just closing up shop. Okay, so it might be in the same town. I hope so. I hope it is like in the just like him just causing havoc on this town. I think it'd be great. What I don't want it to be is like, and look how crazy white people are. Well, actually, I'm totally <laughs> fine with that. But if, if if it's if it's just as like, and all these people have their own like, they're just they're, they're just cogs in the wheel, and that's why I'm here <laughs> fucking with them. It's like, no, I'd rather him just why? have no, just completely nihilist. Like he doesn't. Doesn't yeah. care. Yeah. He just wants to live. Yeah. I think this this book is going to be that because um, there wasn't any redemption in this issue. I yeah. mean, it's just kind of like it, like kind of like life. Like things happen. Well, and maybe that was just kind of an overall like view of how they wanted to portray certain characters. Like you do have people that you like in this story that would m- maybe redeem. Yeah. Like this jackass psychotic demon guy coming in and just messing with people, which is also really entertaining and fun, right. but not redeeming. Yeah. I don't know. Spoiler alert, this issue kills a main character. <laughs> 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 you don't have to put that in there. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know which one. <laughs> the main one. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the main one. <laughs> I really like this book. It was very, very good. All right, next up we have Days of Hate, words by Kot and illustrated by Zizelge. Thank you. At least according to Google. Perfect. If you don't know, Alice Kot is a very talked about author, pretty prolific on image. He is an author with deep intellectual thoughts and opinions, of which he has no fear of expressing in such books like Wolf, Generation Gone, The Surface, and Zero. And that is definitely what we get here in Days of Hate. The book opens up with a quote from Steve Bannon calling women who marched on the Women's March dykes, followed up by a quote from a band called A Silver Mount Zion, which is famous for opening up this record company called Constellation Records, which thwarted the whole record company and is basically kind of the typic- the most like prolific folk um, anarchist band that uh, is around these days. So those juxtapositions in some ways are giving you what we're going to get here in Days of Hate. Days of Hate is a book that starts in the year 2022 following two fem- female protagonists, Hu Yan Zing and Amanda, who were one-time lovers who fell out of love due to a conflict and miscarriage, then were thrusted into the arms of a guerrilla anti-fascist fighting group and taken a hold of by the feds hunting down other hate groups. So we have two women who used to be lovers now fighting violently other hate groups. We got layers here, boys. (laughs) We start with Amanda's guerrilla anti-fascist uh, crew finding a nightclub where there is a swastika painted on the wall, and we find out that a secret nightclub full of, I, I guess a gay nightclub, people in there were burned alive by another hate group. After naming what they think might have actually done it, 
they decide they're going to extract their justice on a group called the Knights of the Black Sun, like knights in shining armor. Not before saying they will also need to take out Kansas. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Which who hasn't had that thought? Right. (laughs) And so maybe a group, maybe the entire state. We don't know. The majority of the story... Maybe the band? It could also be the band. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I have a probably real problem e- with this book now. Probably <laughs> equally racist. I'm not a fan, are they? They're not. I don't think they're racist. Okay. Sorry, Kansas. Um, the majority of the story is told through the eyes of Zing, uh, who we, is getting recruited by the feds to go fight this um, and infiltrate this Nazi sympathizer group. Um, she, who actually prefers to be called an alt-right group, and we'll get into that eventually. She... Through her relationship with the feds, we find out about her past relationship. We find about, uh, out about this other hate group. She's a falconer, in case you wanted to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this book gets into a ton of things that are topical, um, probably today, but in a lot of ways, just the political discourse of how we've been covering the news. It's staged in 2022. We've been here before. This is the future. Alice Cott pages, paints a world for us that is not post-apocalyptic, but is essentially where we would draw conclusive lines of where hate is in the media today. Do you think that this book correctly represents a conclusion of where politics are at today? Where politics are at today? I don't know. I got too jazzy with that question. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I think it's an accurate portrait of if the attitudes now go unchecked of what could possibly be. Like, we've already had attacks on nightclubs. Yep. Gay nightclubs happen already. Um, Who's to say if uh, in the media or politics, if that was kind of thought of just like, well, that's their fault for being gay, if something like this couldn't happen that's in this comic book. And the most inland, and I think this is common knowledge, but the most inland terrorist attacks in the country are actually done by white supremacists Mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And I also think it's interesting that on the other side, uh, the government in this story, on the other side of the story, like the meanwhile, they're talking about placing people in appropriate little hubs or camps and how that is softening the language of or trying to get away from what they're really what they really be doing in allusion to Japanese internment camps and then kind of walking that back just with language, but doing the same things. Right. Like saying this group is too radical, we need to maybe put them in a certain place or like a correlation to the real world, like these certain countries, we can kind of already tell what kind of people will be trying to come from these countries. So kind of just alluding to different things. The most dangerous weapon that hate groups ever discovered was branding. If they can brand themselves differently (laughs) and uh, more appealing to people, that's like worse than a tank. Totally. I think one thing that's interesting about this book is, and I wouldn't mind this book, if, if, if it was just a justification for radicalism and we're going to get Nazi killers, like, I would be like, cool. I, I, there's not enough Nazi killing for me in, in all of media that can <laughs> occur. <laughs> but that's not what this is. This is actually going to go into the psyche of radicalism and what it what hate on both sides looks like. I recently heard an interview from an ex-neo-Nazi who was a skinhead who said, basically, you know, most of my violence was just fighting what we called anti-fascists, like skinheads who were anti what we were doing, inner group fighting. And I think that this book is an interesting take on that version of, like, hate. Is, I think this book is asking the question, is it, is there somebody, or is hate ever justified? Is it, is there anybody that pushes it too much to be like, the wrong thing you're doing we're going to do that wrong thing to you, and we're going to organize to make sure we um, extract justice on you. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Two wrongs equal a great comic? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Probably. Yeah. That's probably exactly what's going to happen. Uh, I've always tried to adhere to the, you know, violence brings on more violence, and I always thought that, you know, just because you're supposed to rise above what someone else is doing and figure out a better way to get rid of uh, all the evil in the world. But, I mean, man, it sometimes does seem that, like, there's no other way to 
extinguish violence, but with more violence. So it's, it's right. a real tough question. Well, and, yeah, I'm just thinking about the scene in this book where she is being hounded by everybody to put out for this for this Nazi guy. The, and she's undercover trying to essentially kill this guy. But And she does, but it's like a weird sense of like, I don't want to say like I'm like, yeah, you kill him, but like you're not rooting against it to happen, which right. is interesting just processing as you're reading it because of what's going on today in real life. Totally. You think there's going to be any alt-right sympathizers mad about this uh, book? And I'm not talking like... Uh, I don't know if they can read. That's oh a good God. point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I hope they really are. <laughs> and if you listen to this podcast, go fuck yourself. I mean, I don't. I guess I wouldn't really care if they were offended, but I would actually want them to think yeah. about what it's trying to say. Just like I hope that I think about these kinds of things, right? And don't just take them at face value. That's what I love. I'm so glad you said that, Caitlin, because this book kind of puts it, turns the coin, and says it's easy to say who's the dumbass, and and it is. It, it's oh, by the way, it is so easy to make fun of all right people, <laughs> but to like when you point that finger, there's a thumb pointing back at you, and are you also a dumbass? Yes, but I'm not a racist. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't I don't intentionally try to be a racist. I benefit from a race, racist society. Yeah. Well. Okay. If you want to go that far, yeah. Privileged as hell. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, grab this book. I guess. I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah. I liked it. If yeah. you're in the alt right, you will not like it. But you should probably read it anyway. Yeah. You may like it. Maybe that. Maybe they like that Bannon quote. That's how they hook them. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Oh, finally, a comic for me. I did read it because I'm like, there is this weird, tangential, I'm sure, alt right version of a comic book person that's like, you know, they're so on the spectrum of like communism that they're like so far that they just became alt right. And I kind of thought, like, whoa, wait, is Alice Cott like secret <laughs> alt right evangelist? <laughs> yeah. Obviously not. But there was a moment I had. He's going to turn it into a pro alt right book yeah. right under that our That has nose. to exist somewhere, right? Yeah. Not like, well, like early Captain America. No, that's not. I made that up. <laughs> well, early Captain America. He's very pro America. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like to a degree where you're he, just like, hmm. he's fighting Nazis, though, right? He's fighting. He's fighting racial caricatures of Asian, Italians, and Germans. Whoa! I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. There's a couple of early comic books where you, if you go back and look at them, you go, hmm. Well, we know where America was at this point. Yep. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to cover a book called Go West on Alterna. And actually, uh, if you guys are following us on Twitter, we ran a little poll earlier in the week because um, we want to do this more often, kind of open the gates to you guys to suggest books that we should cover because uh, we don't want to cover things that you don't want to hear. Uh, so anyway, we ran this poll, and um, with a resounding win, an overwhelming number of votes, this book from Alterna, Go West, Go West uh, won by a, a fucking landslide. You guys really want to he- us to cover this book. Um, so here we are, covering it. And uh, a little thing about Alterna, they're um, an indie publisher. Uh, all their books are $1.50. That is so badass. Which is Fucking awesome. In, a, in an industry right now, which is bumping the price up, up, up with uh, comic books, $1.50 is very doable. Totally. You can get multiple, multiple titles of this of, of their books, and it's awesome, and not spend all your paycheck. And I think they print the majority of it, I'm not sure, on this newspaper print. I think that's their, I don't want to say shtick, but that's their, like, uh, go-to. They're, they're, bring, they're, they're, they're trying to bring back newsprint. Feels great. I love the texture of it. It does feel very like vintage and throwbacky, and like when I was a kid, all comic books were in newsprint. Agreed. How, however, Alterna, if you're hearing this, when I pick up your books in my comic book store, they're often bent because of they don't have the resistance. So why don't you send me a couple of uh, bagged and boarded <laughs> number ones over here for my collection? That'd be great. And the price is not reflective of quality. Like oh no, they have some really really great books like Doppelgangers. Doppelganger. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah, they're they're they have a lot of to borrow a word from Budget King bangers. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> All right, so Go West 
Old Maniverse and Find Your Next Grizzly Cowboy in this book. We see the Blade, a man who is preparing to leave on a quest for vengeance. He is leaving the home that recently belonged to him, but we learn his wife and child have been killed by a band of the bad and ugly led by a man named Creep. The Blade puts his family to rest and makes quick and bloody work of catching up to Creep and knocking them all off one by one, shot for shot. He is clearly um, a seasoned badass, and in this book, the action shots are quite impressive. There's also a layering to the art that I found pretty interesting. It pulls focus and it gives a little bit of visual depth to what's happening in the story. Question for you guys. Is a character bent on vengeance and revenge interesting in and of itself? I always think about the end game. Like what happens after this one thing is complete? Are you, is it kind of one dimensional? The answer is it's always never enough. And my answer is I'm okay with that. I love a story on justice. Like, g- give me all the Punishers and John Wicks you got. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm going to consume them every damn day. It is very evocative of that. It's like, it is futuristic, but remaining Old West. So. But you, you, you bring up a good point. Like, once they kill everyone that they need to kill, they can't go back to, like, their manager job at Kohl's or, like, uh, their normal <laughs> life. Like, what do you do now? Yeah, I mean, he's unleashed, unleashed the blade. And so now the blade will have to join a cir- circus juggling axes. Yeah. The blade's I loose. I mean, I've yeah. seen some Cole's staff that probably could be murderous at any given point in time. <laughs> That's a good point. May not be a deal breaker. He, I'm saying. he did not kill all of his wrongdoers, the people that he had a vengeance against in this book, did he? Yeah. I thought so. I mean, I thought he, he, f- killed he them found all? out. Mm-hmm. So what is, where do we go now? I think the blade knows. The blade's loose. Only the, the blade, blade knows. knows where to go. <laughs> the blade's loose. <laughs> Once you unsheathe the blade, you can't no. resheathe <laughs> the blade until it tastes all the blood. All the blood. Is he going to be just the destroyer of everybody? What do you mean? Like, is he going to be a villain now? Well, in a weird way, the Frank Castles and maybe the blades of of these stories seem to me to be very odd sorts of protectors. They do have a place in stories past their own vengeance and justice, but it's maybe solely in finding other justices that need to be right. done. And the beauty of John Wick and, and Frank Castle uh, stories is that they got nobody to protect, in theory, besides maybe their animals. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I guess they've <laughs> lost everybody. Yeah, and so like the only, the only thing they're keeping warm at night is their vengeance. Which is a cold sure. mistress to have in the bed. <laughs> mm-hmm. But boy, do I want to watch it happen and unfold. <laughs> you, that was, that's a good question, though. Like, are they going after the wrong vengeance? Because you don't see the Blade or John Wick at, like, the Women's March trying to get real justice or, right. you know, calling their senator or governor to get some real so, uh, social, ch- Jesus, social change. <laughs> like, they're, it's kind of very selfish justice. Totally. And it's just an arms race. It's like, you, you pushed my nuclear button so far that my nuclear button now goes off and you have to see my nuclear destruction, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. They weren't, they could have run for office, be a school teacher. <laughs> That's an, those are other that forms is of called the police. That's <laughs> the slow justice that they're not interested in. They want that fast justice. And, and, and those are the justices I'm not interested in reading in a comic <laughs> book, so I'm glad they didn't make that decision. <laughs> yeah. You don't see a Ruth Bader Ginsburg comic. But I would like to see them in the vagina yeah. hats. Like That's if somebody true. can draw <laughs> yeah. that. The blade, yeah. a little fan fiction blade in the yeah. uh, in the. If he had a vagina, vagina hat. hat instead of a cowboy hat, totally the, into it. Oh god, this comic <laughs> would have sold millions. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoy the artwork in this. You I do. thought it was the you get a lot of close up shots, a lot of uh, really intense um, kind of tightly framed photos, or not photos but pictures, uh, and I thought that kind of really. Uh, invoked a feeling of it. this is going to really focus on him and his journey and the revenge that he is seeking and most likely going to get. Yeah, he's going to get it. <laughs> Somebody's going to fucking get it. Oh, yeah. The blade's loose. <laughs> Heads are going to roll as they Hashtag say. Hashtag blade is loose. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, yeah. Go go west. Go grab it. Go pick it up. It's a one in three, right? Yeah. yeah. Three part, so um, three issue limited series. This is one thing that's super cool about Alternative, which I used to love, is they print everywhere that carries 
yes. their uh, comic books in the back. And some, some people still do that. So you can actually see what retailers carry Alterna if you buy pick up one of these um, in your state. The great state of Kansas has zero. They have one now. Oof. Oh, they do? Yeah, I it's saw not, it in Doppelganger, not, too. not listed here. No. But, uh, okay, perfect. Just just the one. Prairie Dog Comics. <laughs> Ooh. M- Missouri, on the other hand, has a plethora. Yes. That's a good uh, thing to bring up, though. If your comic book shop doesn't have it, tell them to get it. Yeah. Yeah, totally tell them to get it. Because there, there, there are some great titles coming out right now from Alterna. Do not miss them. Yep. If you don't, if you're the type of person that consumes this podcast and you don't know that, that you can you can order on things online, you can do them digitally. If you walk into your comic book store and you say, could you order this for me? That's the best way to purchase a comic book because they might buy a handful of them. They're trying to track retail and sell it. So that's like a, do that for Alterna because Alterna is doing some great things in comic book and they they totally deserve your support. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Go West, number one. Um, Closing out? Any thoughts? Closing out? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> my wife told me, that when the music ri- raises up and we say all those things about ourselves, that nobody listens. <laughs> it's like the curtain call. like yeah. uh, <laughs> And I was like, oh, she turned off, she skipped the podcast when we started going, Fountain City Frequencies. And, uh, oh. recorded, and I was like, oh, you're going to miss the cool, like, the, the callback. Sign-offs. Yeah, the sign-offs and stuff. She's like, you know nobody listens to this once you start saying all that stuff. Oh, no. And I was like, crap, I do know. Yeah, she's so, right, though. Let's do our sign-offs and then do all the bullshit where we say all the legal tags. Legal, okay. Legal IDs. All right. This is Budget King and one na na <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Was that it? I was waiting for more. <laughs> that was it. It was like, yeah, like oh, Batman. One We've been na. spoiled by your performance pieces before. Sorry, yeah. I didn't know I was going to do it. That's more intimate. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Greg Liktai signing off. I am Kayla Morosik, and I will show myself out. Po- uh, the First Issue Club podcast is a proud member of the Fountain City Frequencies of Podcasts. We were recorded in KCR Studios. Our music is by Primary Color Music, and we are edited and produced by the young and talented. Did you call him Buxom? I did. Buxom. Matthew Hodap. Woo! Um, thanks a lot for seeing us. We already did our sign-offs <laughs> there before. <laughs> you probably aren't even hearing this. If you are hearing this, we're on Twitter. If, if you're hearing this and you want something special, let us know something crazy about damage that you saw, and I'll send you my damn, uh, those buttons they give out, those DC buttons Ooh. for all the metal stuff. Oh, okay. I don't know. Yeah, Does, do people do want those? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They can have my, my here's, two. My, here's a fun little thing about people. They love free shit. <laughs> I, got, I got a plethora of free shit for you. You heard them, folks. Get yeah. us at Twitter. Tell yeah. us your favorite thing about damage, and I'll pick one of you. Boom. You gotta say bye. Like that bye. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that part makes it. You gotta say bye. <laughs> oh.